Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining this. I'm Dimitri Darimov. I'm co-founder and CEO of Modern Treasury, and uh, we're a payment operations platform that um, was founded in 2018. And so we have the pleasure of working with many of the folks on this panel, both as a startup and 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 um, as a product. And so uh, I'm very excited about having this group of experts talk about the time uh, that we are today, like in the market, and the state of the startup ecosystem and how companies can really build uh, during this time and utilizing financial services to create enduring valuable businesses. So we'll start with a round of introductions. Um, Jess, why don't we start with you? Thank you so much for having me, Dimitri, and hi, everybody. There's $100 billion spent annually in the events industry, the majority of which flows through your major hospitality owners and operators like Hilton and Marriott. Yet there's never been any purpose-built system to allow them to manage the funds flow. Today, Carrots and Cake is the first and only financial operating system that allows property owners and asset owners to have access to drive incremental revenue through events, which is the single biggest opportunity inside hospitality today. And our platform includes everything from payments and invoicing software to financial reporting and data to embedded lending. Awesome. Ashton. Cool. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, and thanks for having me, Modern Treasury team. My name is Ashton. I'm co-founder and CEO of Silo. Uh, Silo is building vertical SaaS for perishable food and agriculture, which is obviously a massive um, a massive supply chain. It's like this trillion, trillion and a half dollar a year supply chain in the United States. Um, and so we provide uh, vertical software for a lot of businesses in the perishable food and ag supply chain. Um, we do everything from like their purchasing, their receiving on their loading docks, inventory management, all their sales, accounting. Um, and in order for those tools to work for them, they have to bring their networks to the platform um, and they push our tools out into those networks. So we've now kind of become the system record for food around North America. We've got about 40,000 businesses in the network. Um, and we handle everything. In addition to the vertical SaaS, we deploy a lot of like payment tools and now lending tools into those networks. Uh, and uh, so a lot of data for underwriting and collections. Uh, excited to be here. Thank you both for being here. I think you know we'll hear a lot about the uh, experiences they've had building uh, building products that move money and building uh, experiences for customers that are um, very uh, very exciting. Uh, we have a set of um, folks who help companies, help startups from various perches. We'll start with uh, Tilly with SVB Capital uh, and then uh, go to, to Damon with Gunderson, Detmer and, and Kurosh with SVB. So why don't, why don't we get uh, you guys to introduce yourself? Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, my name is Tilly Bannett. I'm with SVB Capital. We are the equity arm of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, we have about $9 billion of assets under management today. Uh, those are assets that are not off the bank's balance sheet. So we invest uh, in, um, with partners, limited partners from uh, really all corners of the world. Uh, and uh, today we have several uh, several fund types. We've got a fund of fund where we are, um, we have a concentrated portfolio of, uh, of GPs uh, in the industry and we have our direct equity fund which I'm a part of where we invest in companies traditionally at the series A and beyond. Uh, we are a proud investor of modern treasury uh, among uh, many other companies uh, in this ecosystem. Wonderful, thank you Tilly for all support. Uh, Damon. Awesome, thanks Dimitri, thanks MT team. Um, nice to meet everyone. My name is Damon Zainshai. I'm a lawyer with Gunnarsson Detmer. Just a little bit about Gunnarsson. Gunnarsson's probably the only law firm that, uh, you know, represents startups and venture capital firms that, you know, support those startups exclusively. As a firm, we're about 400 lawyers uh, globally. We represent over 2,500 venture-backed and public companies. We represent about 500 venture capital firms. In 2021 alone, I think we helped our startup clients raise over 40 billion in venture capital, including myself personally, Modern Treasury, been working with Dimitri and the rest of his team, I want to say since 2018. Um, I closed probably about 70 venture and debt deals uh, year over year. Work with Modern Treasury, work with Palantir pre-IPO. I'm very involved with, you know, the YC class year over year, essentially twice a year. And yeah, happy to join this webinar. And my name is Kurush. I help lead our payment partnership team at SVB. 
Honestly, I wish I could say I chose a career in payments, but the honest answer is payments chose me back in university and I never left. Uh, when I first started helping Fintechs build their payment platforms, SVB was a consistent name that always came up. And probably what persuaded me to join three years ago is what makes this bank so special, right? It's the simple fact that we are a FI that banks the innovation economy. So we aren't only banking startups, we're banking their investors too. And that allows us to really tap into this unique ecosystem that really provides us the opportunity to, you know, support some cutting edge companies that are disrupting industries of all sizes. So I'm energized every day. I get to share my time with the people on, on this thread. And then um, I get to partner with companies like this to help make payments easier together. So I've been loving it ever since. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. And as you can see, we try to bring together a set of experts that really uh, have a view at the market today from, from all different directions. And so the way we wanted to organize this and start a little bit with uh, a little bit of the macro and then jump into specific tactics and, and stories and case studies and ways that uh, founders and, and, uh, and companies can think about building uh, enduring companies in this market. So Tilly, maybe we can start with you. Given your seat at um, SCB Capital and looking across the ecosystem, I'm wondering if you could help provide some commentary on what's happening. We all read the news. It's it's obviously been a very uh, news-packed uh, few months or, or maybe years, but what are um, some of the changes and some of the cause of the changes and the things that uh, would affect founders and, and, and we need to kind of think through? Sure, sure. Well, yeah, definitely has been an eventful year. I'd say even an eventful month week and and day like it's it's uh it's never a uh it's 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 a interesting times that we live in in our industry um as we've seen in the beginning of since the beginning of 2021 uh the public markets have taken a dramatic turn um i would uh, since the beginning of 2022 sorry i would start with some words of optimism you know, downturns have created some of the best companies uh, of our times, uh, companies such as Airbnb, Pinterest, Uber, WhatsApp, AppDynamics. Those are all companies that were created uh, uh, right after the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, you know, we all know scarcity breeds uh, creativity. Um, and from the investor perspective, we're no less excited about this period of time as we've been uh, over the last decade, we think this this year will uh, will will have fantastic companies uh, be created. Um, but if you let's take a look a bit at the numbers just to see uh, what's actually happened in terms of venture activity, um, you'll see here on this uh, slide that venture activity has dipped quite quite a bit, uh, both in terms of deal count and dollars invested into companies, really beginning in, 20, in Q1, uh, but in a more pronounced way in Q3. And my expectation is that this will continue uh, in Q4 as well. Um, mostly this is because of macroeconomic conditions coupled with geopolitical volatility um, that has created a flight from uh, public equities, uh, and then therefore resulted in this dramatic uncertainty uh, within the private markets as well. Um, if you look at just uh, actual numbers in the macro uh, environment, specifically for public equities, what, you, what you'll see on the next slide uh, is that public company valuations have decreased dramatically from 2022 in this year. Um, and so you can see here, valuations were at an all-time high in 2021. As an example, forward multiples for SaaS companies were 19.3 in 2021. Compare that to 5.8x today. Uh, likewise, payments had a 5 point, an 8.5x forward multiple compared to 4.4 today. And marketplaces had 5.3x forward multiples compared to 2.1x today. Um, while private markets uh, valuations have fallen a bit since 2021, they've not done so as dramatically as the public market down valuations. And so what you're seeing is there's still a pretty big gap between public market valuations and private market valuations, as you can see in this slide. 
Um, you know, I believe that that gap is largely holding weight because companies have put off priced rounds. Um, so we saw the latter half of 2020, as well as all of 2021, brought huge influxes of capital to companies who raised. They raised huge, massive rounds. So those companies haven't all really needed additional capital in 2022. Uh, and the ones that actually did need some cash for runway, we saw got liquidity through instruments that were mostly non-dilutive. Uh, many companies came to SVB for venture debt. Others used safes or notes to get more cash. And some even extended their previous rounds using their last round valuation. But we haven't really seen much of the repricing just yet. Um, I believe that in 2023 and 2024, it'll be interesting to hear Damon's opinion as well. Uh, many of these companies that raised in 2019, 2020 will need to come back to the markets for new equity rounds. And that's when we'll start to see the repricing of the companies um, or unique structures uh, that Damon's probably starting to be privy to. Um, in the meantime, most VCs are saying, well, all right, no reason to invest just now because let's just wait for the repricing next year um, where we can get better deals in the next 12 to 18 months. So, uh, you know, later on in this webinar, we'll talk about what companies can really do to buttress or support their companies, be, build real enterprise value so that they can command better terms and valuations uh, over the next 12 to 18 months and build resilient companies. Wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, Damon, I wanted to ask you kind of to follow to follow up with the specifics and kind of mechanics that you're seeing uh, uh, founders grappling with, and like why why does this matter to startups and to founders? What are the other um, elements that that come into this that start making decisions around building building companies and and, and externalities from for founders to consider? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, fully agreed on everything that Tilly just touched on. I would say our private law firm data tracks pretty much exactly to the slides that are being presented here. We probably got intonations that, hey, the market is shifting, that deal flow is going to start, you know, being start driven down, you know, as early as Q4 of last year. And, you know, kind of to re recapitulate what Tilly said, the reason that deal flow is down is because repricing has not happened yet, right? And to the extent repricing has happened, you know, what do we see? We see, I think I like to couch things in both like a quantitative way as well as an emotional aspect, right? Quantitatively, investors are, you know, pegging valuations to more tangible metrics as they have, you know, done so historically, you know, things like revenue or number of customers. Valuations generally are far less, you know, I hate to use this word frothy than they were a year ago at this point in time. In the early stage for, you know, early stage seed or even pre-seed funds, you're seeing more concrete expectations regarding number of customer logos, prior operational or founder team experience. On the late stage, if you're trying, you know, if you're pre-IPO, if your target IPO is 18 months out from your last fundraise, you're kind of using post-IPO startup valuations as a benchmark. And, you know, candidly, the strongest IPO since 2020, just take a look at the NASDAQ, they're still down, you know, 60, sometimes north of 70% year to date. So that creates for a hard market. And that, I would say, tethers immediately to the emotional aspect, right? The emotional aspect cannot be discounted. If you're a founder and, you know, you raised around in Q3 2021 and unnamed, uh, you know, growth equity firm in New York tells you that your company is worth 10 billion and you're thinking about fundraising this year and you're looking at a 40% haircut, that's a very hard pill to swallow. Um, so completely agreed with Tilly, I'd say out of my cohort of 65 startup clients, people are increasingly looking at venture debt, primarily from SVB. You know, SVB has been in the game forever. The deals can take a matter of weeks to close. They're very efficient and also bridge equity rounds, right? In terms of safes, convertible notes, you know, extending a series A or B round that you may have even raised two and a half years ago. Those are all certainly in play. Tilly, any other thoughts about the um, effects uh, and, and the implications for founders before we we jump into um, a few more specifics uh, from, from the world Damon's focused on? Yeah, uh, yeah, I would just say that what we're seeing is also a, uh, a pretty uh, 
uh, pretty big slowdown in just uh, pacing of investments from, from 2021. What that means for founders is that they, uh, ones that look to be raising in uh, latter half of this year or early next year, should start building out relationships with VCs. Uh, the VCs that I've spoken to and myself included are looking for founders that we know well and have uh, de deep-seated relationships with um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a means for you know, betting on a particular company in this, in this period of time. Wonderful. So Damon, what, when we talk about what this actually means mechanically uh, and into kind of the legal details, what are the types of provisions and things that you're seeing that maybe you weren't seeing a year or two ago? And what are things for founders to think about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you don't mind moving on to the next slide. So at a high level, let's say you generally, you know, get a term sheet tomorrow or, you know, Q1 of next year when we're still kind of in this in this pocket, in this, uh, you know, in this deal flow. There's a couple of things in the term sheet that'll be, you know, turned into the definitive agreements, that's, you know, how you secure venture financing that have dramatically changed in the past year. And I want to say, you know, these lists of eight points, it's, it's kind of in order of, uh, order of importance and also order of appearance, right? So first and foremost, protective visions. What protective visions are at a high level are investor specific, you know, preferred stock specific blocks that VCs ask for in connection with every deal. What's changed in the past year is that they're asking for much more investor favorable and tight protective provisions that, you know, for example, if you have a lead investor in a syndicated round, the lead investor, even though they're not taking up the full round, may say, hey, we want a blocking right, we, right? We want absolute control over what your future financing looks like. Whereas in the past, it would have been a broader base vote, right? You could have potentially closed your Series B round after Series A financing without the lead investors buy-in 100% of the time. Uh, moving on to number two, this kind of flows organically into operational control, right? They're asking for more operational control in terms of founder revesting. Founder revesting is something that's commonly approached, you know, commonly broached by C stage VC saying, hey, you know, you've been working on the company for three years since inception, you and your co-founders are 75% vested. Let's you know walk back back that vesting 25% or 50%. We're now seeing that again, you know, even in the later stages to essentially control for founder and executive buy-in and you know commitment to the company. There's increasingly service requirements, which is saying, hey, you don't get to designate your founder directors unless you're providing you know full services in your capacity as an employee with the you know academic theory being in a down market more things are going on some of those things may be negative and there could be more turnover even amongst the senior ranks lower valuations we already you know till we already kind of covered that in you know in the last slide but there's also kind of backdoor mechanisms for companies and for VCs to present a term sheet that on paper reflects the same or even a higher valuation from you know those frothy valuations we were just talking about while on the back end still getting what's effectively a lower valuation or a discount and that flows directly into points four and five here right warrant coverage warrant is a fancy way of saying an option to purchase securities at a later date right so you may be getting a term sheet where your company is valued you know at 500 million and that's a fair multiple but on the back end the VC is asking for penny warrant coverage or warrant coverage at the preferred round strike price that gives them additional economics and ownership in the company without having that being reflected directly in the valuation that you publicize on TechCrunch. Um, liquidation multiples are another mechanism to get to that exact same point, right? In a good market, liquidation multiples, and I'm sure you know plenty of people I've heard this term use, 1x non-participating preferred stock. Uh, if you guys do any sort of reading in, you know, kind of industry reports like the information, et cetera, there's been a lot of growth stage companies, you know, even amongst my clients who are raising funds with, you know, a 2x or 3x liquidation multiple. And that's a way of the VC saying, hey, you know, I want two or three times of my money back, you know, in the event of a tepid exit. Seniority, participation rights, kind of additional, I would say, rare mechanisms to get to the same point. Seniority is saying, 
the Series C stock, right? The the last round of stock that you're raising is senior to you know the, the stock that came before that. So they get their money back first. Participation rights, it's another way of saying double dipping, right? You get your preferred liquidation preference, and then the stock thereafter converts into common stock and gets to participate in the liquidity event a second time. Tranched milestone-based investments. Um, just a quick summary of that. We now granted these are you know rare instances, but we are seeing term sheets being cut where the VC is saying, hey, you know, we're committed to putting in $15 million into the company. We'll put seven and a half in today. And seven and a half when you hit, you know, a certain AR, et cetera, metrics, you know, six to 12 months from this point forward. On the flip side, we're also seeing tranched investments simply, and this kind of goes back to the conversation 10 minutes ago, simply because funds are having more difficulty raising capital at the same clip that they were in 2021. So I'm looking at multiple deals as we speak right now where the VC has a signed term sheet with a prospective company, but they're fundraising at the same time. And they're saying, hey, you know, we can only put in this amount of capital right now before we have our second or third close of like our latest and greatest vintage. Pay to play and redemption, just to cover those really quickly. Pay to play is essentially a way of saying, hey, the investors have to do something proactive and put skin in the game, usually in terms of investing their pro rata or their existing preferred stock gets converted into common stock and they no longer get the special rights, economic privileges, et cetera, that venture investors you know, typically receive. Redemption put rights, I would flag that these are quite rare, but you know, these are instances where the company is obligated to buy or the investor has a right to sell under certain conditions and after a specified period in time, typically when you know, a next great round of financing has not been raised or the company has not realized some sort of exit event. But yeah, Dimitri, I mean, going down the list, those are generally the half dozen or so hot button issues that we've certainly entertained this year and are probably going to entertain in some capacity going into 2023. Yeah. Thank you, Damon. It's definitely definitely a little bit of a different time, but you know, this is the backdrop. I think this is the the market backdrop against which uh, investors and others are making decisions. At the same time, the best thing about technology is that at the end of the day, markets follow founders. And so I think that uh, we at Modern Treasury have kind of started the company really believing that um, every payment over time will start to end in software. And that interface uh, allows for a lot of customer delight and allows for a lot of value to be generated in companies that, um, that founders will build over time. So I think there is a lot of... Uh, uh, a change, uh, perhaps, in uh, roadmap, a change in how founders build companies that will lead to sustainable, profitable companies. Uh, and, and we have really good examples here with some of the work that uh, Sal and Carrots and Cake are doing. And they're really incredible uh, businesses that are being built, you know, at a very, a very uncertain time that we're very excited about. So maybe uh, to start with, Tilly, just uh, on that embedded finance uh, thread, Tell us a little bit of how you think about valuations and company uh, kind of cash flows and, and things like that. When you look at companies that have uh, maybe a SaaS or a marketplace element and, and they have an embedded payment opportunity, um, how do public markets think about that? How do you think about as, you know investing in private companies? How does just the SVB ecosystem see that as an opportunity? Sure, absolutely. Well, I, I go back um, a second and, and say one of the ways that we are working with our portfolio companies and more broadly our client base through this period of time where a lot of founders are quite jittery about raising now or even in the next year. Um, and one of the things we, we tell them is, well, are there creative ways for you to latch on new revenue generating opportunities? One of which is uh, embedded fintech. Um, and what that means is we're embedding fintech services uh, uh, to your offering. So specifically, what is embedded fintech? It's the ability for companies uh, outside the core financial sector to be able to distribute financial services. Um, all of that really has resulted uh, over the last few years from open banking and maturation of APIs that have really allowed for interoperability between traditional banking and software companies. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see some examples of financial services that are being embedded into software. Um, and, and these are, uh, 
I'll, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, but some of these are, are, for example, payments. So that would be the ability of a uh, company to both access as well as process payments on behalf uh, of another uh, customer, uh, and that is called payment facilitation. Um, Karaj can speak uh, a lot about this uh, as well. Um, so if you look at uh, um, if you look at uh, a company called Toast, which is a company that we spotlighted as being as being kind of a an iconic company that has uh, done a great job of embedding financial services. Uh, they are, uh, for those who don't know, Toast is a restaurant point of sales uh, and management software company. Uh, what they've been able to do is on the payment acceptance piece, been able to process payments on behalf of the underlying restaurant businesses. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, Toast is offering insurance uh, to uh, restaurants, so they are offering workers' comp, uh, BOP policies, there we go, um, and restaurant-specific policies to their restaurant clients, so uh, enabling them to really monetize off of the insurance piece as well. Um, they are using the data uh, that they have on their underlying clients to underwrite the risk, um, and that's uh, proprietary data that is incredibly useful when, when thinking of the insurance business. Um, lending is another great example that, that uh, we've seen uh, happen. Um, Uber is a great example, offering loans to drivers. Um, uh, cards uh, is another business where uh, companies can offer their underlying businesses cards for those clients that they serve. Um, and uh, Marketa really pioneered this space uh, of modern card issuance. Uh, we also have another company in our portfolio, High, no High Note, which does uh, card issuance. Um, and that's a really sticky way. That's a really great way of creating stickiness with, uh, with clients and their underlying customers. Um, and lastly, payroll is the ability for uh, you know, payroll software to be able to provide payroll software to clients. Uh, Toast is doing that with their uh, underlying restaurant clients as well. Um, what does that all mean, though? I mean, it's great that uh, you have, uh, you know, additional uh, sources of revenue. Um, I'd say if you go to the next slide, you know, all of this means not only by embedding fintech that you're improving top line growth, you're expanding your revenue per client, uh, creating much better client retention. Um, ultimately, what that translates to is better top line uh, numbers uh, and augmented enterprise value. Um, what's interesting to see in this case study is if you take a company like Toast and another company, Lightspeed, that is in that same area, what you'll see here is that you know, Toast offers a higher percent of their revenue or of their business going to payments. So even though they have, you know, lower overall margins uh, at 16%, their top line as a result of the payments is higher and their multiple is higher, right, than, than light speeds. Um, so we, we think the market is rewarding Toast for embedding fintech and having a, a, a big chunk of their uh, their their volume of revenues come from payments because of all the collateral benefits that result from uh, from from the embedded fintech piece. So I'll stop there because I know we've got really exciting uh, startups who are who are doing this and uh, in real time and can per and can tell us their stories of how they've embedded fintech and how that's resulted in uh, increased uh, enterprise value. Yeah, thank you, Tilly. Let's let's jump into the the specific stories. Maybe Ashton, let's uh, let's start with Silo and uh, tell us tell us a little bit about um, the uh, your journey and what you're building and the vision for where uh, maybe payments fits into that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, because uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, we started with kind of building a core platform for a lot of our businesses, just kind of a lot of the back office and business automation. Um, a lot of the businesses in perishable food and agriculture were. We're managing their workflows across their businesses in just like a highly fragmented way. It's like notoriously, um, you know, 
lagging in technology. Uh, this is a Procore on the last slide. We have a lot of Procore folks at Silo. And, um, you know, Procore used to joke in their employee onboarding that construction was like the second least digital industry on earth followed only by agriculture. Um, and so we've kind of come into the space trying to digitize it. And we started just by helping these businesses kind of like streamline a lot of their business operations. Um, and we always wanted to kind of build, you know, a digital smart food system. Almost half of what we produce in, in, uh, in the food system goes to waste. Uh, so with a lot of the data that we can, we can pick up with these businesses running our vertical SaaS, uh, we can, we can, you know, build this network that's smart and essentially reroute food and build a marketplace. Uh, but a big component of any marketplace is like payments and removing the financial risks to transactions. So as we started to generate a lot of these invoices, uh, we did a lot of the purchasing for our businesses. We did all the accounting, you know, about 18 months ago, we decided that we'd, um, we'd get into the transaction flows by building a lot of fintech. Um, and that would help continue, continue to help a lot of our core users um, you know, modernize their businesses, get into digital payments. We get, we, we, we did a lot of checks. Um, we still do a lot of check processing. Um, but it, it, you know, provided a lot of value to our core users, but it also just provided a ton of network to a, a ton of value to their networks. And it helped us build our network much, much faster. So, you know, our journey was to build this core platform, which became the system record for these businesses, um, you know, the average user on Silo spends seven and a half hours a day in the app. It's just like, you know, where they live. Um, and, you know, so we had really great data on the individual businesses themselves, but we had a lot of data on their networks and we wanted to remove friction and risk from um, their existing relationships. And that would help us then like, you know, add more more stickiness to our network and like drive more folks into our network. Um, so we kind of went on this journey of building first payments. Um, we started with Bill Pay. We essentially built like our own verticalized version of Bill.com. And uh, we we built that ourselves with all of our own, you know, we built FBO accounts and our own kind of payment rails um, for bill payments. And then uh, we were also generating a lot of invoices um, and sales on the other side. So uh, as we saw bill payments kind of picking up we um, and getting a lot of traction from our users. Um, you know, Bill.com has a network effect too. So we're seeing on the other side a lot of folks coming into the network, adopting payments. Uh, we decided we get into collections, and again, kind of built a lot of our own payment systems there. It, again, it was, it was food and agriculture I was dealing with a lot of paper checks. So we actually built like our own lock boxes and PO boxes and our own FBO account, FBO accounts there. Um, and so that like really helped us to to create a really sticky network. Um, and a lot of value to that network um, where folks could then like adopt collections and 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 bill payments to a lot of like back office automation that allowed us to provide bookkeeping as a service because we ran all their accounting um, as well. And um, and so there's a lot of value to the individual user, just a ton of stickiness. But then there's so much stickiness with the network because at that point, like, you know, everyone's customers were reliant on paying to Silo and everyone's vendors were relying on Silo to get paid. Um, and at that point, like, because we, you know, we were collecting better than anyone could, and we had all this real-time data, we could underwrite better than anyone could, and we got into to lending. Um, and a lot of the other services that Tilly just mentioned, you know, folks are asking us for payroll, they're asking us for lending, they're asking us for cards, um, and it's because, you know, we brought in payments. And so uh, about a year ago, we ended up hiring Amazon's head of, head of lending. Um, Jeff built Amazon lending over 10 years and it was a lot of like supply chain finance. So we got into like supply chain financing and all of that's just powered by, by payments. Um, so well, payments for us isn't going to be massive transaction fees. It enables a lot of transaction fees for us. So, you know, the value of our user now, um, we can sell a lot more users with payments. I think our sales team sells like six times as many accounts a month now that we offer financial solutions. But the value of those those transactions also is like 20 times as high as selling SaaS. Um, so it's just like very sticky um, and it's, you know, allowed us to grow our network much faster. That's an awesome story. Uh, Jess, you're probably in a business that can give uh, Ag a run for their money for being not very digital. So tell us a little bit about what you're building. Yeah, I would say that um, the events market might actually be agriculture now based on everything that you just shared because um, we're just starting. Um, Carrots and Cake started as a marketplace inside the events industry with a focus predominantly on weddings. Um, and we built the marketplace to over 40,000 businesses. I bootstrapped the business for almost eight years. Um, and in working with them, over 40,000 businesses, predominantly hearing that they needed 
sort of better marketing and brain acquisition realized two things very quickly. You had $100 billion flowing through these businesses and no one was paying attention every single year. And most importantly, that almost 80% of that $100 billion is flowing through your major hospitality players like Hilton and Marriott. But those are just the brands. It's actually the property owners and the operators and the asset owners underneath who really care about the cash flow. And the biggest surprise is that they didn't actually have a challenge in sort of advertising and customer acquisition. The biggest single challenge is that there was no system of record for this $100 billion. The properties, and still today, a lot of major properties that don't work with us, um, are sending out PDF credit card authorization forms, um, and they are collecting checks for an incredibly meaningful revenue stream inside their hotel operations, especially coming out of the last couple of years. Um, the average property that we work with, which is everything from a Hilton to a Marriott to a Hyatt, to a Four Seasons, to a small independent owned property, does about two to $6 million a year in event revenue. Um, the majority of which they are literally using PDFs and credit card authorization forms and sometimes Excel files to collect. Um, so leveraging all the relationships we had inside the industry and having over 10,000 properties on carrots and cake, we started testing and building out the first, what we called, yes, the system of record, but it's bigger than that. The first financial operating system specifically for events. Um, and payments is a core piece. That is the biggest single piece of friction inside this industry is, and it's not just the actual payments collection, it's everything that happens after that from the funds flow back to the venue, as well as the entire client experience. Our average transaction is somewhere between twelve and $25,000, depending on the time of year. And that is a single payment, usually inside three to four payments for an entire event value. Um, for a venue, we process everything from a wedding down to a corporate event and a small group booking that could be $250,000 where you're doing a buyout of the hotel. Um, all of these hotels have had innovation inside their core businesses, which are F and B. So a lot of the properties use toast um, and it powers you know, a very specific need for them. Some of them also have software inside heads and beds. And this really overlooked revenue stream was kind of just left by the wayside. Um, and what's interesting about it is at the property level, it seems small, but again, we sell into the operators and the asset owners who are rolling up sometimes five to 150 assets. So you multiply that four to $5 million revenue stream across, you know, 10 to hundred assets and it all of a sudden becomes incredibly valuable. Um, and for us, you know, when we first started, um, I was manually charging the cards on the back end. I shared this, you know, story with very unsavory story with Dimitri, you know, but like, as you start to build out the product, you realize how important it's not just, you know, payments, people think, you know, it begins and ends at that transaction, but actually that's just the beginning of the entire flow. And it's the data and it's the privacy and it's how you're then transferring funds and managing that cash flow back to, you know, whoever the end, you know, partner is for us. In our case, it's a lot of times it's a hotel, you know, as well as what is that in client experience, you know, for the consumer, who in a lot of cases is, you know, spending well outside their average transaction volume on their payment rails. Yeah. Payment operations is such an interesting uh, area because as you're talking about this in, in both in both cases, you added payments, um, sort of a distinct moment in time when you started, started uh, supporting that as a feature of the product. And then, you know, you discover sort of uh, a million things that can go wrong or can go, uh, can go awry. Um, Karosh, maybe talking a little bit about SVB Bank's role in this. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of different industries with their own unique dynamics. Obviously, there is a banking industry sort of interface that uh, you're very focused on. Can you speak a little bit about what you're seeing, how SVB supports it? What are things that founders are thinking about in, in kind of getting into um, something where there's an embedded finance use case should be thinking about in, in, in both picking a bank partner and picking like what type of experience to deliver to their end customers? Yeah, you know, first, the, the first way we really support some of these clients is at the foundational level. It's, it's, the, it's kind of focusing in on operations, right? How do I collect funds from users or my customers? And how do I pay vendors, right? And we also have integration partners that can help with, you know, basic bank needs like spend management. 
But the second way, right, and it's the topic we've been talking about, is how we support payments through an embedded payments lens. And, you know, traditionally, if you think about financial services, it's always happened with and provided from the bank, which is a real separate experience outside of the software or platform. But now, as you can see, just hearing from the folks on this panel, you can now get those same services from the software provider powered by a bank. And so given the fact that you need a bank to even have any financial services at all, naturally our clients came to us first, right? And since we know them so well, right? We underwrite huge, huge loans for them. It's just a natural progression for companies using us for operational activities to want to also use us for embedded payments and, and that flow. So over the last decade, we've been really supporting our clients by really focusing in on you know, how do we make that process or that integration much easier? Is it bringing new channels like API? Is it bringing new products? Or is it forming partnerships, you know, to meet you with you, right, with Modern Treasury that simplify this whole process of money movement for our clients? Can you describe a few of the specific uh, maybe use cases or flow, flows of funds that you've been involved with? And just to give people ideas of what, what are things that people are, um, you know, embedding or enabling in their products? Definitely. So when we think of this embedded payments umbrella, right, we have a few teams that support different solutions. Uh, first and foremost, it's the money movement team. And that really helps our clients make payments easier or make payments on behalf of their own customers. And we heard Ashton say, right, he said, bill pay companies, right? And he incorporated that into his own company. Well, that helps automate that AP or invoice approval process. And to add an enhancement, but also makes the product a lot more sticky, you can now make that payment after you, you know, approve that invoice. And essentially what's happening is that that bill pay company is making payments on behalf of that SMB, right? They're making the payment, uh, like they're making that utility uh, payment on behalf of the SMP for them. You know, our newest area, our newest team has been payment facilitation. We've heard this a couple of times in, in this presentation too. And it's really to help our clients to embed uh, payment acceptance into their platforms. And I really began to see this when I came to San Francisco, right? Uh, at first I was paying these ridiculous rent. I was applying and I'd have to go pull up, fill out all these applications. And when I wanted to sign my lease, right? I had to go get a cashier's check. And this was during the weekend. So all the banks were closed. I'd have to go drop it off in some sketchy neighborhood where the property manager office was. And it was, it was a pain, right? But we started to kind of see a lot of these landlords uh, utilize these property management softwares. And these software companies begin to actually embed payment acceptance into the whole flow. So what was happening, right, was when I was, you know, at the point of signing that lease, I could actually make and take my security deposit and do it online and do it through a bank transfer. I also then had the option of paying my rent with my credit card each month, right? And so that whole experience was now embedded for me and made it much easier than going and dropping off cashier's checks every month. So at the end of the day, right, what embedded payments provides is, is just an easier experience that not only benefits our clients by allowing them to add new features, add new revenue streams, and kind of make it an all-in-one process, it also helps users like me, like renters, have a more integrated experience. But ultimately, what I think is so amazing is that it just helps bring, uh, bring payments into these non-traditional industries. And we're seeing that with carrots and cake. Uh, we're seeing that with agriculture. We're seeing that into the wedding business. And truly that's great for the world of, uh, of innovation and the innovation economy. Yeah. So we have uh, a lot of... Uh... A lot of passion supporters for this. If 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 founders want to turn and uh, explore kind of a better payments in their business, um, Jess Ashton, I wanted if you were to go back to when you were uh, going down this road of of adding payments, like what are some of the considerations and challenges that you think um, you, you you would tell yourself back then, based based on what you know now? What are the places where you really got to get it right as a um, as a founder? Maybe Ashton, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um... I mean, I think, I don't know if there's anything like had a lot of trial by fire in the last 18 months that has like helped me quite a bit, just, you know, learn a lot about, you know, what matters to our users, what, but, you know, what matters to a lot of SMBs probably, um, and then how to kind of structure those things. Uh, but I think like really what it all comes down to for, for our industry 
and probably for most folks in payments is like transparency and speed. We're, we're probably seeing this with a lot of the stuff that's happening in crypto right now. Like, where's my money? And like, can I get it now? Um, and I think that that's just, you know, it's always been the, the feedback that we've gotten from so many of our users just like, you know, I want to know where my money is at any given time. And like, can you make that faster? Um, and that kind of led to a third thing for us, which was just like the diversity of the number of types of payments that we have to support. Um, you know, we have we have businesses that, um, you know, like our bill pay volume just like took off because they wanted to use Silo for everything. They wanted to do all their payments. Um, but we had a lot of growers who were coming like over the border to some of our users um, and they needed like physically to have the check in their hands so they could go to Western Union to then like cash the check and then take the cash over the border. Um, so, you know, our we supported like check sending, we supported international wires, we supported like domestic wires, you know, we supported everything, but like we had to actually build like a check printing functionality and then payments just took off. Um, because then we could do everything. So we had to support like all those different types of payments. And then the same thing on collections, you know, it just goes back to like um, building trust. Um, but early on, like even on bill pay, which which is like you're sending money, you want more time. Uh, folks were always asking like, hey, I want to send my vendors updates on like where the payment is. Like, is it in the mail? Like, um, you know, when is it going to get there? Uh, when has it been cashed? And like, can you speed up that process? So for us, it just like always comes down to like speed and transparency and then like the diversity of payments. We support like every payment method under the sun for bill paying collections at this point. Um, and then like you have to go through, you know, sending a check or collecting a check in the mail is totally different transparency than like sending a wire or an ACH. Um, and so I think those are the sorts of things that you know, as I tell like our payments teams and our capital teams, it's just like always coming down to like those two things, like transparency and speed. How do we speed them up? Like, what are the partners that we could be working with to like speed them up? Can we like, you know, as we get volume, can we renegotiate like, you know, our SLAs? Um, so those are just like always the things that are top of mind. And we learned, the you know, not necessarily the hard way, but we got a lot of feedback, even just like the first payment product we ever released. You know, like I said, it was a bill pay product. And it was sending checks in the mail. Everyone sends checks in the mail so they get extra time with their cash. Um, but they were taking too long, you know. And so we were getting um, hit up by folks who were paying, saying like, "Hey, like I need visibility." And now we have this like UPS status tracking type thing, um, which is really helpful for folks. So for us, it was just the diversity of the payments. I kind of underestimated that, um, and a lot of banks don't support so many checks, which we which we which we do. So we've had to build a lot of stuff for ourselves there. Um, and then just transparency and speed have always been like where the feedback comes from. Just to echo that, I think uh, for us, we've seen across our customer base that co completeness of platform is really important. Uh, because in the payments world, it's it's very sort of awkward to say you don't support a certain a certain payment type or a certain thing. So it's led us as a as a tech provider, it led us in the direction of you know doing payments, doing ledgering, sub wallets, things like that, adding compliance for KYC and KYB and, and things that you need to do as a as a company that's in the space. And and I think that uh, just to echo that, I think it's it's definitely something that a lot of companies are experiencing where they start somewhere and that somewhere is not quite sufficient for kind of full customer delight. And yeah. then they have to keep expanding. Yeah, just to add on that, like there's been tiny little payment tools that we've had to build, like, you know, some little payment function that maybe it was only like five or, you know, less than 10% of the payments they did, but like it unlocked 100% of the payment volume because, you know, folks just want like one place to do all their payments and you have to support all of them. Yeah. Jess, what, what about your journey? What would you have told yourself when you started well, down this road? Well, I think building on what um, Ash is saying and a bit what you're saying when you say delight, Dimitri, is that payments are actually like the way that we see it. It's a customer service operation in so many different ways. It's like the transparency, the speed, like everything that you're talking about. And so people sit there and I think we said this when we first chatted, Dimitri, the first time we connected, it's like people are like, oh, payments. It's literally like run the car, the cap. No, and it's, it's everything that happens before that. It's everything that happens after that and it's both on like the end consumer who's making the payment as well as the you know the business that you're working with and like we sit you know directly in the middle of both um and i think 
part of it from like an entrepreneur perspective is, you know, when we started building payments, you know, almost two years ago, we started with an embedding lending product and I had no idea what we were doing. And I had no idea, um, you know, how that works or even to call it embedded lending. I just knew that there was an opportunity to get in the middle of the funds flow. And that it was insane that, you know, the average venue was sending an invoice for $40,000 and a consumer was paying, you know, on demand. It was like the only large transaction that still functioned that way. And it made no sense. Um, but I think that, you know, at that time, all of it is around customer, like all of it is around the operations function. And then that's everything that like, again, Ashton was saying is that it's all of those things around like, you speed things up, but then you realize that, you know, you've got to put in check tracking because like they need to understand, you know, when the deposit is paying. And so like for us, you know, we were like, oh, you can split up payments, but then you realize that operationally, oh, a property is not set up to collect monthly billing, even if you make it seamless, even if you embed it directly into, you know, how they work. And so you're building operational efficiencies and you're building, you know, you're streamlining the way cash moves, but then you also have to meet the industry where it is. So all those other features that you have to build on top of it, they might seem, you know, from an outsider, it might be like, oh, that's totally inefficient while you're doing that. And it's something again, that Ashton that you said, it's like you build one small thing that to somebody, to an outsider, they're like, why does that matter? And you're like, well, that just unlocked, like that just opened the entire box for us, you know, building that one thing. And there's a couple of features in our product that no one else does. And that's when one of the beauties of working with, you know, Modern Treasury is like, we've came to you guys and we're like, hey, we need to do this. And, you know, sometimes you're like, that's non-standard. We're like, we totally get it. But we're like, this is what we need to figure out how to do. And, you know, you do those things. And then all of a sudden you realize that it's that tiny feature, which is, I think, why, you know, embedded finance and building vertical specific becomes so valuable because these industries that need very specific, very specific operational features on top of their financial tools, it's part of what makes it so sticky. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I'm going to maybe close with a, with a question that um, maybe put put a couple of you on the spot. But at the end of the day, I think all, everything we talked about, like, you know, the, 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 you know, the companies we're building, the valuations, the, the, the legal work, the banking, all of that comes from customer delight and, and kind of the sales that happen and, and the customer service that our clients are getting. So uh, this is kind of an open question to anyone, but are the, what's your favorite, you know, client or sale or, or case study of somebody using your product or maybe Karosh using SVB's kind of fintech services that really stands out to you as, um, as, as just like a cool kind of anecdote. I think that, that that's the things that I think ultimately put all of us, um, uh, this entire ecosystem, this entire innovation ecosystem in business. Like, what are the things that really stand out to you as 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 an interesting uh, uh, client? I can go first. I can talk about a, one of our portfolio companies, a company called Bluevine, um, that uh, started off as, a, as an online factoring um, play uh, about eight years, nine years ago. Um, and at some point realized, well, hey, you know, it's, that's nice. It's, it's, it's a nice business, but our clients are really interested in a, in a much more holistic uh, banking service. And so they started to offer uh, DDA accounts. They, they started offering bill pay. Um, and so really today, I think they've morphed into a SMB bank. Um, SVB works very closely at pa powering many of those features and capabilities. Um, but I've, I've seen uh, this company uh, and watched them closely. And I think it's, it's quite fascinating to see their tremendous growth now that they've moved into this uh, in, uh, real banking services. They're servicing uh, tens of thousands of clients today, which is quite remarkable. Um, and so I'd say that I, I'd say they really listen to what clients want, similar to what we've heard from both Ashton and Jess is listening to your clients and evolving uh, in accordingly. Um, so it's it's a similar theme, which I've seen play out really well. Yeah, Dimitri, I don't know if I'm allowed to even call out your own company because I feel like that's been such a great journey in itself. Uh, but I think for me, uh, it's not just been one. I, I think it's just the diversity. And I kind of was talking to this towards the end. It's just the diversity of how we're able to bring payments to all these traditional industries that 
you know, had never even thought about payments, right? Being incorporated into their experience. And that's what energizes me, right? That's what excites me because that's how we kind of spread payments to the broader world, right? And incorporate it into everyone's daily lives. So I think for me, it's just a diversity of what you're seeing uh, with how it's entering kind of agriculture, with weddings, with even fertility benefits, right? There's just such diversity that it's, it's exciting time to kind of see how this is evolving. Ash and Jess, any, any specific clients jump out? I wouldn't say like a specific client, but I think like a really interesting learning probably relevant to this discussion is like our core platform is is like a pretty intense, you know, it's like effectively like a really hardcore ERP. Um, and, you know, to adopt an ERP, especially in like our supply chains, like food doesn't sleep. It's going like 24 seven. Um, so like, to, you know, to get a lot of our businesses to to think about like switching their ERPs used to be like a big deal. Um, but when we introduced FinTech, we actually like broke it off into its own standalone business line um, called Silo Finance. And like we call it SciFi. And, uh, and like SciFi, we will integrate into like their existing ERP or accounting system. And then we'll provide them bill pay and collections and credit. But we get so much like high fidelity data out of that like real time integration that we actually just build like SciFi is just like a feature flagged version of our core platform, like this huge ERP. Um, and so to like to do your collections, to do your bill pay, like we need your customers, we need your vendors, we need your like all of your real time orders. Um, we we just as we integrate, like we pull that data in real time and we like build a shadow ERP in the background. Um, and so as we like sold everyone on, uh, we got a bunch of people who are like, hey, like I'm in the middle of my busy se season, like I can't adopt core. I'm interested in like this technology, but like, can I just take sci-fi and we give it to them and then you know, a customer would call and say like, hey, like Walmart's calling, they need like a credit on invoice number 10, you know, can you like help me credit that or like edit that invoice? And we just like unfeature flag our order management, like all your orders are there. They search invoice number 10 and like they can update the invoice silo then like has the Walmart connection, like the contact information, like we send the the invoice. And so like what we found was just like everyone who was adopting sci-fi just like immediately transition to core because we had like all their data like running in parallel um and so now we tell our sales team like you don't even sell core anymore you just sell fintech but like we've sold more core deals in the past six months than we've ever sold before because you know of the power of, of fintech and like you just get so much data out of it and like there's so much value you can provide value really quickly um and then like you can get people to adopt the whole ERP just like naturally, you know, so there's a lot of power in fintech um, as like a wedge, you know, into many other parts of whatever business or industry you're working on. We have a very, very similar story um, and that we don't sell our marketplace anymore because that was one side of the business. We only sell like very similarly, like we only sell access to our software suite. Um, and then that turns on access to the marketing, but it's like, it's, you have to almost, you have to meet your industry where they are essentially is like the biggest single learning with, I think, you know, FinTech in some ways. And when you're doing it, you know, not in a traditional, like coming from banking as a service, you know, traditionally. Um, and I think that's, um, the biggest thing, I mean, from a customer story perspective, like we're not supposed to share in user data, but like I still answer the customer lines. And like, when we hear from like an end consumer at a property level, even though wedding payments are a small portion of what we do now, because we power everything for these venues, hearing from an end consumer that like being able to pay monthly versus all at once, like fundamentally change their family experience. Like that's something that's exciting when you get to sit on both sides of the equation where like, I know that a big like brand like Marriott's not super excited about that, but like, it's exciting to see it, you know, flow all the way through. Awesome. Well, I want to, I want to thank everybody for for joining today. I think uh, everything that that we're hearing here on this webinar and everything that we're seeing as Modern Treasury, a big part of it is really the internet is reaching kind of the far reaches of the economy in, in a way that um, maybe maybe wasn't the first things that uh, internet entrepreneurs decided to go tackle. And so all of a sudden, 
uh, even despite everything that's going on in the markets and and investor sentiment and things like that, uh, I think it's a really exciting time to go innovate in parts of the economy that haven't really been messed with by entrepreneurs with, you know, uh, web products, marketplaces, fintech flows, things like that. So um, if anyone's interested in, you know, payment operations, of course, reach out to Modern Treasury, but everybody here on this call really uh, is is a great resource um, for you. So thank you all for joining and, uh, and taking the time to spend with us today.